So we're halfway through May now, which means that we're halfway through Mental Health Awareness Month. Now, when it comes to these sort of awareness months and efforts and initiatives, which I see trotted out, even though I tend to like to think that they're done with the best of intentions, from time to time I can't help but feel as though perhaps they're just a, well, a little bit counterproductive in a sense. Now, again, they're put on with the best of intentions, but it kind of strikes me a bit like Christmas. Now, throughout the entirety of the year, whatever sorts of attention we're supposed to be paying to the tight bonds we have with our friends and family and loved ones is just sort of passe and ordinary. But then once a year, we're just strongly encouraged by the entirety of our culture to, to really just focus on our bonds with other people, only for that short time, and then we'll more or less go back to sort of dropping them back to the normal levels of either indifference, non-communication, periodic communication, or perhaps if you have a strong bond with your family, regular communication altogether. Now, it really can't be altogether surprising that Christmas is a highly stressful time of year, not just because people worry about how much they're going to have to spend taking care of getting the gifts and doing the travel plans and all of that, but also that pressure to perhaps spend more time than you would care to with people who you tend to love in your own right, but then find yourself forced to do so. Now, with Mental Health Awareness Month, it's not exactly the same thing, but part of me kind of feels as though the entire matter is more a matter of people just patting themselves on the back for acknowledging the fact that they or someone that they know struggles with a mental health condition. But all the same, as it is Mental Health Awareness Month, I thought maybe I'd just pour over some of my thoughts regarding what some of the causes and effects to these sorts of things can be. Now, here in the U.S. alone... In 2016, 44,965 people, almost 45,000 people, killed themselves. In 2017, that number jumped to just over 47,000 people. The U.S. currently ranks 27th in the world in terms of our suicide rates, and in this country alone, 16.2 million people are diagnosed with some form of depression. That's 6.7% of the adult population. And I want you to keep that one phrase in mind, diagnosed. Because a diagnosis, as we know, requires something more than a WebMD visit or Dr. Google telling you that you have one of any number of terminal conditions. But that it requires an actual professional, a trained, licensed professional, to issue a diagnosis in this respect. But when it comes to these sorts of things, what are the, some of the well, driving factors that might be sort of pushing us further and further into these dark holes that we find ourselves in? I know for my part, there are loads of things which drive my depression even deeper than it naturally already is. And it's a curious thing when you consider a comparison between the advanced Western world and those of the more poverty-stricken or war-torn developing third world nations where people perhaps have to walk five miles just to get the day's water for the family, and the children, when they're not having to perhaps work themselves to the bone just to help the family get by, are more than content to play a game of soccer with a deflated basketball or something of that nature. And it's an interesting thing, because overall depression rates, you will find, oftentimes in these sorts of areas, are actually much lower. Not because they're altogether more in touch or more attuned to the human condition as much as they're too busy surviving to actually spend the time to be depressed about how awful they think things are compared to what they think things might ought to be like. Now, when it comes to these sorts of things, asking yourself the question about comparing your position or life to those of others does play a rather strong role, I feel. And in the same respect, as I've said in previous videos, I can't help but feel that social media itself is probably something of a driving factor in this. And consider, if you will, the constant stories we hear about how mental health and stress and strain are actually placed on people by social media, by their indulgement in it. Typically because when you log into Facebook, for instance, what you're presented with is usually the best face and best version of the lives of people you may be close friends with or people who you are just generally acquainted with, showing you how wonderful their vacations and their families, their promotions, their homes, their cars, and all of the little accoutrement of their life tend to be, asking, or at least sort of pushing you, 
to then reflect on your own and compare them, even though we all know it's not healthy to try and keep up with the Joneses. Even beyond this, though, the false lens of social media is one which also gives us a really you know, bloated, and I'd say bogus sense of what really adds value to our lives. With so many people out there hustling to be influencers, especially in places like Instagram or even here on YouTube, the false democratic consensus as to whether or not an idea or expression or piece of art or anything at all, let alone just the fundamental nature of life itself, is valid, being measured by this false democratic consensus offered by likes or dislikes, shares, views, follower counts, subscribers, and all of these other things. It is enough to drive somebody mad, especially if you make the mistake, as I have, for instance, hinging a great deal of your personal or your professional life upon these things. But even outside of that, the, the raw notion of somebody who perhaps might be clinically depressed, whether it be it uh, will be diagnosed or simply just a matter of their nature that hasn't been treated yet. Logging into things like social media and seeing the explosive stupidity which seems to be churning out of this modern pop culture of ours, not to mention the immense amounts of stupidity which are continually seeming to rain from the sky in the forms of political and social debates with the most hot-button issues being offered the hottest takes by what offer, oftentimes are some of the simplest minds around, and then asking oneself how it is anything is supposed to get better at all when so much of opinion is shaped by a stupidity machine such as Twitter. It can be easy to understand how a thinking person can find themselves falling deeper and deeper into levels of despair, especially when coupled with that otherwise fundamental nature of comparing yourself and keeping up with the Joneses in this sense. But the further effects of social media, I find, are even deeper, too. Much in the same way that we've had for ages people noting and denoting how there doesn't seem to be any more family dinners going on. There are no more hearts in which homes gather around. People don't usually spend the same amounts of time with the people they live with as they perhaps used to. These days, most people in most homes, it seems, spend the majority of their time on some kind of a device or another, all by themselves, off in different rooms, and if, in some cases, they wish to talk to perhaps a family member who they live with, it's just as easy to send a text or a direct message or a Facebook message than it is to go and physically talk to them. At the same time, though, the kinds of effects that social media seems to have had on our overall social environment one in which people actually genuinely seem to think that on Facebook, for instance, that they have 4,000 actual friends, despite the fact that they've never spoken to probably half of them and won't speak to the other half for a good long while with any real meaning or substance in the course of their use of the platform. It's cheapened and weakened the nature of social bonds so much that it does seem, or at least make a good amount of sense, as to why it is friendships and relationships are so easily broken up and disposable and replaceable in the eyes of many people these days, especially within generations growing up with this being the established norm of their social interaction altogether. It's a quantity over quality sort of effect that it seems to have. Your 4,000 friends on Facebook wouldn't mean shit compared to five truly good lifelong friends which you may or may not ultimately have. Even those deep-seated friendships can oftentimes fall victim to the misunderstandings or miscommunications that the off-the-cuff nature of our communication via these platforms tend to lend us, which explains to a great deal why stories of old friendships or relationships breaking up over arguments and disagreements on Facebook or miscommunications via direct message tend to be more and more common. While to many people, the very concept of a meaningful and deep one-on-one -on -one conversation seems that much more alien as we continue going forward. So when it comes to the very concept of social media itself and its effect on not only our social lives, but our perspectives and outlooks on the world itself, is it really unfair to say that it's got a net benefit in terms of our mental health, when in fact it seems that people are getting worse and more despondent as time goes on, and find themselves turning to these platforms in the hopes of alleviating such, only finding such driving those same problems even deeper and further on as they go. But even beyond this, beyond social media itself, 
There is also the sort of nature, especially here in the United States, when it comes to the nature of things like depression. Now, recently I actually sat down and watched Stephen Fry's documentary. I believe it's called The Secret Life of the Manic Depressive. And in the course of this documentary and the sort of follow-up piece which came out afterwards, there were a number of stories of people who were just so deeply mired in their misery and depression and mental illness that they did things such as stepping out into traffic or throwing themselves off of balconies. And there's no shortage, as I said, of suicides here in the U.S., with everything from self-inflicted gunshot wounds to swallowing handfuls of pills to people who are just generally careless with their life and health simply because they don't care. But in the course of watching this documentary, the sort of hopeful upswing to it was showing how people benefited when they actually sought and received the treatment that they needed. The curious thing to this, though, is I, being someone who himself struggles rather routinely with a chronic sort of depression, I found myself curiously envious of the people featured in these, in these, in these documentary shorts, in these segments. And it wasn't because I thought, well, lucky you, you got to step out in front of traffic or fling yourself off a balcony. As much as it was that I realized that the availability and access to treatment, as well as the sort of safety nets to keep seeking treatment from ultimately ruining their lives entirely, are simply things that don't really exist here. Now, in my own depths and swings in the midst of heavy depressive periods, I've actually gone to seek out treatment myself, only to find out that even the community mental health clinic won't accept people unless they have either private insurance or Medicaid. Now, as I've actually alluded to in previous videos and posts and the like, and if you've ever had a conversation with me, I've probably told you about it, there's this bent irony, I find, to the simple fact that there's a certain area of poverty where you're not quite dirt poor. You're not quite homeless. Maybe you're bordering on it, but you're not quite there. Making private insurance, for instance, simply unaffordable. If you're living hand-to-mouth, just trying to keep the lights on and keep a roof over your head, $400 a month for private health insurance is, well, it's just not really in the cards for you. But at the same time, you can be at this level, because here in the U.S., the altogether federal and generally on a state level too, uh, levels of what is considered proper poverty haven't really been updated in quite a while. It's ironic then that in a situation in which one is genuinely suffering from the effects of poverty, barely making ends meet can be told by the state that things such as Medicaid are simply not available to them. So in this case, I have to wonder for myself as having gone through this myself, how many other people out there would perhaps even openly and willfully seek treatment, but are not able to get it simply by virtue of its cost and inaffordability? Now, following this, at my worst times, I've actually had friends who've been through similar situations suggest that I just go check myself into a hospital or facility of some kind, even if it's just a last-ditch effort to receive whatever kind of treatment I can. But even in this, the simple amount of time taken away from what little work that I do and my searches for other jobs and the hustling, hand-to-mouth sort of game we have to play in order to keep ourselves afloat, well, the simple act of taking time away from that would mean that what little is secured and safe would be ultimately erased. And if you're in a position such as myself, where you don't really have the sort of support base in terms of friends or family who could put you up and help you get you back on your feet, especially given the fact that it took me a number of years myself to do so before and that I've seen other people fail even worse, the option of going into hospital in that sense appears more like an option to just take on mountains more debt as well as potentially making you homeless when you finally get out. The access to mental health treatment is something which, in my opinion, is as vital and important as access to basic health treatment, and in fact, perhaps, it's just a little more complicated. This brings us sort of to, like, one of the last aspects of this that I find rather interesting, and that's because of the sort of stratified social natures that a lot of people find themselves living in and around, and the nature to mental health itself the very act of recognizing that there's a problem that you need to seek treatment for can be difficult unto itself. If you take a manic depressive, a bipolar, or somebody with chronic reoccurring depressive bouts and incidents, the thing that's really difficult to remember for those who maybe don't suffer these things 
is that when they're in the depths of those dark and awful places, it doesn't feel as though anything's wrong, necessarily. Oftentimes, in the midst of a very depressive episode, the bleak outlook on life, the notion and thought that the world is just hopelessly fucked, darkened, and that there's no hope to be had, it doesn't feel as though something's off, because you're viewing it through the lens of a depressive. And then when you're doing such, it simply seems that that's the way things really are. And when you look back on times in which you didn't feel that way, you can find examples of things perhaps that you feel may have kept you from feeling that temporarily before coming back to the underlying existential dread which you unfortunately you call your depressive episode as a means to just sort of acknowledge that that's just the way the world is. Because if it wasn't, you wouldn't see it that way, would you? Beyond that, the simple act when in the midst of a severe depression of even getting up and going to a doctor and seeking help or reaching out at all is one which requires an extraordinary amount of effort, often. This being because feelings of futility and hopelessness lend themselves to just about everything you can think, making even the concept of reaching out for help or seeking professional treatment seem like a hopeless and futile gesture unto itself. Now, all in all, while I do like the idea of there being some sort of call for the public to acknowledge that mental health is a very important issue that we face, and that it takes the lives of thousands of people each year, and especially when odds are good that they or at least one person that they know suffer from or experience some form of mental illness, I do hope that we can at least manage not to just find this Mental Health Awareness Month as a convenient excuse to pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves for just acknowledging that a problem exists, and that we can continue a conversation, a dialogue, or at least to keep the matter in our thoughts as we go forward, considering what can actually be done to address or at least improve the circumstances surrounding the issue itself. Because otherwise, we may as well just throw up our arms and wait for next month to bring whatever new short-term awareness initiative there will be, simply so that we can remember shortly that there's a problem before moving on once again. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubt, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your